can't see. Okay. What's so fast? I don't even need to lay more. How about it? Okay. All right. And applause for Sean. Okay. So how are you guys doing tonight? Good. Good talks before. Sorry for being late. Uh, being a Nebraskan, I guess, I misunderstood the concept of two hours is not soon enough if you're down in Sunnyvale to get back up here. So, But we made the mini bullet or whatever, and so we got it, thanks to some of the, those guys down there. Um, so yeah, my name is Sean Larkin. Um, I'm one of the maintainers for Webpack. Uh, how many here know what Webpack is? Okay, how many here... So I just want to get a good understanding of the crowd. So how many here uh, use Webpack? Okay, that's that's good. Um, how many here use Grunt? Don't be ashamed. It's okay. <laughs> or make files. We can go that deep. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can get hipster or old-fashioned, whatever. Uh, how many here use, what did, I, did I skip on Gulp? Browserify? Okay, cool. So <clears throat> there's a good spectrum of understanding the build tools. So we're going to talk about Webpack today. Um, but I wanted to kind of just maybe give some bits about myself um, that are useless. So yeah, like I said, I'm, I'm Sean Larkin. Um, I'm uh, one of the maintainers for the Webpack open source project, as well as uh, <clears throat> on the Angular CLI core team. Um, you should know, though, I am framework agnostic, and I think that a lot of that comes from just being a part of Webpack and kind of some of our core values, and you'll find out about that. Um, so I'm a UX, officially my real day job is I'm a UX developer at Mutual of Omaha. So uh, if you guys ever want to, you know, like live in a 3,000 square foot house for under $175,000 a year, come to Nebraska and work in Omaha or Lincoln. So um, those are great things. <clears throat> uh, how many actually have ever lived in Nebraska or the Midwest? Yeah, like, you know, yeah, cool, okay, nice. So we're home of the highly controversial license plate draft. Um, it is kind of questionable looking. And then, um, so I like to give this joke. Most people think Nebraska is like right here. <laughs> but this is where I, I live like right here and like works maybe just a little bit over. So um, right in the heartland is what we call it or Silicon Prairie. <laughs> so a little bit about myself. I'm a former tech support rogue or rep gone rogue and uh, got tired of not being able to fix people's problems. Um, I think, you know, we were just working around things that were issues in software. And so uh, I kind of, you know, tried to take it upon myself to learn a little bit. I started with AppleScript and then uh, learned Ruby. And since I was tech support at a Mac shop, uh, I learned Objective-C and that was awesome, but totally different. And then I started doing web development and now I think three and a half, four years into it full time, I'm now you know doing JavaScript full time, I think for two of those years. Uh, so like I said, you'll probably know me maybe from the Webpack core team or on the Angular CLI core team. How many Angular users here? Angular 2? Uh, just like static site generators, I think that's what this meetup's about. Cool. Um, like React. Yeah, cool. That's awesome. Uh, Ember. Yeah, I gotta rep everybody. Uh, how about Vue.js? So if you like one of those things, you guys should check that out. But I am biased. Just saying. Uh, try new technologies. That's good. So cool. Um, there's gonna be a little bit of use for everybody here. So uh, you can pull out your phones if you want to tweet right now. Or you can find me at all these links, but I'm usually at the Lark Inn, so you can follow me on Twitter. Um, one of the things you'll find out later is that I'm all about communication. Uh, I kind of fit the dev advocacy kind of niche for Webpack as an organization, so never ever hesitate if you ever have any questions any time of day. Um, you know, if I'm awake and I'm not doing something, I will respond. So um, complaints, whatever. So just know that. <clears throat> And if you just want to ask me something more personal, not tech or Webpack related, you can go on my GitHub, uh, the Larkin slash AMA. So let's talk about JavaScript modules. So who here knows what a JavaScript module is? You know, we know, kind of. I bet we all have our different ideas of what they look like. And I mean, there's a good reason, but they have some qualities. So like we know they don't pollute the global scope. Um, they're reusable, like I like it, because you can reuse some things over and over again. Uh, they're encapsulated. Um, but they're also convenient and organized. So uh, it allows us to have a little bit more file structure than like who here remembers like that 10,000 line file called global.js? <laughs> who here still uses one? I'm sorry, I, don't be ashamed. I used, yeah, we had that. Um, so like there's a bunch of different ways you can just use JavaScript and some modules. So like you can use a script tag, but we know that's not really a module that you're using. 
um, and maybe just wrapped, but we also have global variables, but we don't want to leak information. Uh, we have, we've all been through like version collision and like five versions of jQuery. Um, but you can use like requires and imports. Those are namespaces, uh, namespace uh, use. And huh, what do they look like? So we've common JS. You know, like if you've used this module, just raise your hand silently, and I'm gonna go kind of quick through it. But common JS, we know what that is. Node JS users who here just uses Node all the time. So like this is bread and butter. This is this is like the safe zone. Uh, AMD Angular users, you secretly use this, so you can raise your hand. Like there's dependency ejection in a nutshell. Um, AMD plus common JS, maybe less common, but sometimes. ES 2015 TypeScript. And I, I should include flow, but it's just a little bit different looking, so this worked. Let's talk about making them all work together. I mean, like this probably isn't your first, like you laugh because it's real um, for the browser, because none of these things are supported in the browser. Uh, but we all want to use them. And every library has a different shape and a different format, and you know we've all dealt with this problem before. I think sometimes this is where JS fatigue really comes from. Um, but I don't believe in that, and you can talk to me about that later. Uh, so <laughs> they all have their different requirements and shape and usage for the browser. So like, wouldn't it be just, you know, it would be nice if it all worked together, but this is just JavaScript. Like, we're not even talking about CSS and images and fonts and libraries that include fonts. So they all have their different ways and needs for processing things. And this is the real, wouldn't it be nice if that all worked together with one, you know, in one format or one way? And so, like, let's talk about Webpack. <laughs> let's talk about it. Um, so... Just like the, the dirtiest rundown I can give you, uh, which may not even make sense yet, but Webpack is a module bundler, but it's not a task runner. And so like a task runner is something like gulp and grunt, um, make, uh, et cetera. Um, but it treats every asset in your entire project as a module. And if one depends on another in any sort of way, it doesn't have to be uh, explicit, but Webpack, can treat this as a dependency. Um, and you'll find out why this is important. So CSS, JS, HTML, JPEGs, icons, SVGs, HAML files, pug templates, Jade templates, whatever. They can all be bundled through Webpack. <clears throat> and it's a static build tool. So like um, you'll never see Webpack code for an exception of a small wrapper inside your, your runtime in the browser. Um, because it's purely responsible for em emulating a module environment and bringing it to the browser. And this may not make sense yet, we'll see. Wow, yeah, I know. Okay, so there's three different ways to use it, and yeah, you can scoff for now. Um, uh, so you can use a config, and this is kind of a scary looking configuration, but the point is that a Webpack configuration file is just an object that, ex or that is exported and it has properties in it. So just think that for now. Each of them have different purposes. Um, you can also use our CLI, and so for like the most basic, trivial, or maybe contrived usages, you could actually configure Webpack to just process JS files, you know, right, right here. Um, you can do almost everything that you do in a config through the CLI if you're like, if you really wanna, I guess if you wanna do that, that's fine. Um, <laughs> And then also we have a node API. So like this is my favorite because uh, a lot of tools, uh, let's say like static site generators or um, you know Angular CLI, they use the node API to hide the you know to abstract this complexity away from the user, which has its benefits but also has its downsides. Um, so instead, you're just calling the Webpack runtime right there, and you're passing a configuration object, and that's going to return the compiler to you. So the whole point of this talk, um, so I'm not gonna show you really, I'm not gonna do live coding, I don't do any of that, um, because the whole point is that, one, I'm terrible at live coding, and two, uh, I want to teach you guys the core concepts of Webpack. Um, something, you know, I haven't been doing this very long, uh, or part of the core team, but what I found out is that a lot of people here, and you can validate this for me, how many use Webpack, and how many understand it? Okay, so 
Um, the whole point is I want to give you the base ideas and the concepts so that you can walk away and kind of break through the boilerplate and do the things that are really beautiful about Webpack, like make it work for any any stack or any dev flow or any environment, because that's what it's truly meant for. Um, and we kind of get wrapped up in the complexity. So concept number one, uh, entry. So uh, the entry point, let's just do a little diagram and maybe this will make sense. Uh, this has some kind of angular E things, so don't, you know, it, it's kind of the same across the board as long as you're not like throwing a bunch of globals everywhere. Uh, so like, you start with one file, and let's say it's like a bootstrap. Um, and that's going to you know, load a component. So if we're using TypeScript or even CommonJS, it doesn't matter. We're going to require that component um, you know, into that file. <clears throat> but that component might also require you know, like some other libs, TypeScript, JavaScript, whatever. Uh, and so those are dependencies of, of that app component. But let's say that external library also has a library that relies on, like, have you looked at your node modules folder? And then maybe that like has a like some other weird dependency that you know you have no idea how to handle. So that top of the tree though, that's your entry point. So node users are like, yeah, I know. Um, but this file is a contextual root. We're changing our our focus from the browser, which you could just slap as many script tags as you want in there and just hope you know the race conditions meet. And instead, you have a sole point that's going to kick off all of your code. And so to Webpack, what this means is that it's going to start at the top of your dependency graph, or I'm sorry, the, at your entry point, and it's going to walk through all of those dependency statements. Um, because we know that each module has a different kind in each asset. And so uh, a, a very simple example would be kind of like this. Uh, starts at the top, <clears throat> and here's some of that pseudocode. And then it's walking down, it says, hey, I see an import. And then it's going to go through and pull all the rest of them and create a graph and bundle that together so that you have just the code that you are using and nothing extra. So in the simplest format, entry tells Webpack what to load for the browser. It complements the output property and it starts the bundling process. So output, it's kind of like you know the yin to the yang. Um, you have your input and you have your output. So output, uh, in the most simple form, uh, can be described with a couple properties on your configuration. So you'll see there a path and a file name, and those just say, hey, I want you to take this file, which is going to be my bundle, so all the modules that have been collected from the dependency graph, and I want you to put it in this one file in a runtime. And I know some people are like, well, wait, no, that's one huge file. And it's okay, you can do lots of things, but I want to just give you the concepts. So um, you can see here in just kind of this example, you know, we have it just being placed in a disk folder, and you have bundle.js. Um, and so, like, it's very simple, uh, but uh, can sometimes be confusing with additional properties that Webpack's output property and everything nested inside. Um, is totally responsible for telling Webpack how and where to bundle these files together. And so the Webpack term is compilations, because Webpack's a compiler. Um, and it works with the entry property. And so loaders. Uh, so loaders are kind of uh, what I see as a large mental block for some people. Um, and some find it, a, it, it just depends. But I always have to uh, give some more explanation on loaders. But so. As you know, that Webpack traces through dependency statements. Um, so requires, imports. This could also mean like a source attribute inside of an HTML template. It could mean um, a import URL from a CSS file. Uh, so Webpack is going to scan all of these. And once those dependencies have resolved, the last step is the translation and so or the, the transform. And so Webpack's loaders are the last process of resolution. And so it essentially tells Webpack how to load these files into JavaScript, which is only what Webpack understands. It only knows about JavaScript modules. Um, so I mean, essentially, you can see the easiest way to define it is this. So you can say, hey, I'm going to pass a regex for the file extension, and then 
The loader property simply represents a resolved node module for a function that can transform that uh, file into JavaScript or to something else. So um, by default, Webpack, this TS maps to a TS loader in your node modules, and it's automatically resolved. Um, so if we maybe had a, <clears throat> a diagram here, each of these things may have some sort of uh, connection through dependencies. And Webpack will asynchronously process these files and transform them into the right format. And there's more properties that are on what we call the loader object. Um, but they are specifically designed to have either more or less complexity or for performance. So let's say you only wanted to search in a certain folder and apply like an, an extra kind of transform, you can do that. And that's using like the include property. Uh, the exclude property is just the opposite. So like, you know, I don't want to run, you know, my lint, my linting across like all my node modules because that'd be slow and you're only really wanting to lint your own code. So just a, a really simple use case. But you can kind of see something here. Another use case I always found is that like who writes their tests next to their their module or their file? You know, that's it's not uncommon. And so a great example is that you may want to for production or uh, just your normal dev mode, exclude all of your test files. So you can do that. And so one of the probably the most unique parts about loaders is that they can be chained together. So I said that they don't always have to be JavaScript, but the last one does. So loaders are chained from right to left. And this is <laughs> some people, <laughs> technically it's left, right, left, but it's most commonly seen from right to left. And so this always got me starting out with Webpack, but I like to just explicitly describe it with a diagram. So if you want to use less in your application, you take it through a couple transform processes. So the first is that you just have a less file and you're going to pass it through your less loader. And so here's our little conveyor belts and we're going to show that. So what is actually happening here is the following. <clears throat> that gets translated into CSS and so essentially, that's part of the resolution process that says, oh, hey, look, we're going to send that to CSS loader. Um, and then that's going to transform into a JavaScript array in memory of those styles. And that's specifically catered for this last loader, which says, hey, create JavaScript module that takes that style and inlines it as style tags in the browser. So this is just one option to load CSS into your code. Because I know you're like, oh, but that would be really inefficient for large scalable apps. So yes, it's just one way, but it's a good way to describe the chaining process. Uh, so the cool thing, or probably one of the most powerful things is our community built around Webpack. And so loaders are not just, we have a core set, but there's this huge community of people who have made these incredible loaders to support any flavor, any stack, any workflow, anything you want. So you want Haml? Do you want Pug? Do you want Jade? Do you want like, uh, I don't know, Twig templates? I, yeah, you could do that. Um, you want Babel? Do you want to use like Tracer if you like ugly JS transpiled? Do you want TypeScript? Do you want uh, like the virtual DOM? Like crazy React things? Uh, it's all possible. Um, it's because a loader is just a function that takes in a file and returns a new source. So most of the time, if you know, you can't even find something on this list, our team is devoted to helping you guys create something that works with your workflow. So loaders, um, they, they tell Webpack how to interpret dependencies that aren't JavaScript. And or maybe special types like uh, ES7, um, but they return compilations. They bundle. They are the step just before things are bundled together. So plugins. Plugins are my favorite because I get to work in the source code. I mean, any of you can work in the source code, but um, I probably uh, have worked on it a little bit more than, let's say, the average developer who writes Webpack or uses it. Um, but Plugins, I want to describe the anatomy first and then show you the usage because it kind of helps bring things together. So a plugin most commonly looks like an ES5 class. So who of you have just written like object-oriented JavaScript? You know, maybe. And you'll see an example, so it's okay if not. But their purpose is to apply functionality throughout the entire life cycle of Webpack's compiler. 
And they do things that loaders cannot. Um, and there's a huge amount of uh, plugins that not only the community has made, but we have made ourselves so that you guys can have incredible out-of-the-box functionality. So here's just a really simple example of a plugin. And so like I said, it's an ES5 JavaScript class. So at the top, our constructor is just empty, but if we wanted to pass options, we could. Um, and then this, the only rule for a Webpack plugin is that it, you have a apply function that's applied to the prototype chain. And so what Webpack does is wherever that is hooked into, uh, it will pass back a compiler, the compiler to you, so that you can hook into events that are happening throughout the entire process. Um, and if, the, like, if this makes sense, uh, nod your head. And if it doesn't, shake your head. So go ahead. Kind of makes sense? It's OK if it doesn't. So and then it, we just export it, because it's JavaScript. <clears throat> and so this plugin right here, what it's doing uh, is that whenever the done event or the failed event happens in the Webpack compiler, it's going to do this little chunk of code which dings a bell in the terminal. So while you're running it when it's finished, or if it fails, you'll know, because there'll be a little ding sound. I think that is actually, I may have named this separate, but you might have, that's a plugin in our core. Uh, so to use it, so like I said, I like to describe them as ES5 classes, even though they don't always have to be, but the reason why is because you're passing, a, you require it into your configuration and then pass a new instance of it. There's certain plugins that you can reuse over and over again, um, and so the new instance helps, one, uh, you know, have unique, uh, unique instances of them, but then also allows you to pass options into the constructor. Um, and so I'll, I'll hopefully get the slides posted because you can see the entire list of plugins that we support. Oh no, what happened? There we go. Um, full screen mode. But uh, there's a huge amount of them made. And here's the kicker. Get ready. 80% of Webpack is made up of these plugins. So the plugin system that you use externally in your configuration is 80% of our code is structured this way. And so rounding back to what is Webpack in the configuration, it's just a big ass object with lots of properties that have single purpose plugins applied to those properties. And so it's just a logic case that goes throughout you know, the configuration. Um, and you can kind of see this here, this is just one of the files. Uh, but look through the source and you're gonna see that and everything ends in plugin, or most of it. I know. <laughs> that was my first, I was like, what? Are you kidding me? So, uh, you know, rounding back to everything, a plugin adds additional functionality that loaders can't, that's the short way to say it, but it allows you to plug into the compiler's uh, entire life cycle and do things that, you know, loaders can't, um, but things that make uh, Webpack infinitely configurable um, in a more or less easy or trivial way. So before I do questions, you know, and I have a little bit more slides, but I'll try to go uh, fast because I know we're eating up time. So FAQ, clear the air. Why use Webpack when I have Grunt or Gulp? Well, so Gulp doesn't know how to bundle modules. I mean, you can smash them together or you can smash scripts together, but it has no concept of dependencies. And so like, let's say you pull in Lodash and you use one function. So do you have, why would you want to be paid the cost of the rest of Lodash if you're only going to use one. And so Webpack allows you to do that just out of the box. Um, and, and so like I like to give this little diagram, even though it's kind of backtracking, but before Webpack or, or bundlers, um, this was kind of the state of things. You had tasks that individually went through certain files. But now, and you know, this is the grunt, gulp, even make. But now this is kind of how we're seeing things and how I believe the future of the web is going to be forward. Um, as far as I'm involved, and uh, we're, we're not going anywhere for a long time. <clears throat> and so everything is treated as a dependency in this tree. And so you get things like incremental builds for only the things that change. You get all of these extra enhancements. And just because you see one tree doesn't mean that it all has to be one bundle. It can be five, it can be static assets that also emit with it. But the benefits of having all of these things managed by Webpack allow you to do incredible out-of-the-box features like minifying, uglifying your code, hashing your URLs, 
Base64 inlining your images if they're small enough um, or emitting them to you know your folders, allowing you to essentially, you know, with just an install of a loader and a loader definition, use whatever kind of pre or post processor that you want. Um, and so that's the power of the dependency graph, along with optimizations. Um, so what's, what's better, Webpack or SysmJS? Uh, <laughs> I hear this all the time, but it's really, they're, they're totally different things. Um, so SystemJS is like, it is a module loader, dynamic module loader for the runtime. And so that code lives in the browser. The only code that Webpack has in the browser is the, tr you know, the translation of the environment. And so Webpack will never dynamically require anything, ever. So like, if you try to put in a GitHub issue, just don't. Because we believe that through static analysis, there are so many more performance gains and there's security concerns from just doing true dynamic requiring into the system. But HTTP2 will fix everything. We can multiplex our app and still have a thousand script tags. No, no you can't. So um, I can show you URL after. You can go to our Webpack Medium uh, publication. You'll see an article that we've put in for HTTP2. Um, a lot of people think that it's going to be the silver bullet to like the, the web apps here today, but you still want to bundle. Think, like, look in your No Module folder. How many dependencies do you have? 500, 400 easy? Um, <clears throat> even though the browser can still support, you know, could parallel 50 at a time, you're still having that huge extra waterfall cost that's going to come with it. So bundle, please, because the gains are incredible. So just really quick, and I'm only going to put like for two, three seconds, but if you look at the comparison for all the bundlers or similar-ish kind of tools, um, take a look at Webpack and just compare across the board the features, or maybe the features that are important to you. You know, this was one of the deciding factors for me, and you know, it's like, Sean, you're naive, you shouldn't just look at data, but um, to me this was so important because I believe in the fact that you should have a tool that works for you, and not a, you shouldn't be able to Wish your stack or your workflow in for something else. And so that's one of our core principles. Um, and we're just, <laughs> we're just scratching the service. Like we have, devs, we have a dev server that lets you build your bundles in memory and serve it up automatically um, with like an install of a, a no module. Um, hot module replacement. Uh, so like that's my weakest subject, but I know it from a high level. Uh, you can essentially Make changes to your code and never have to reload the browser and see those changes. The browser will update. Code will be injected because of our module system. Uh, code sharing and lazy loading. Um, so this is something that's huge where you can separ separate different types of bundles and pull out common use, common require statements out of them and create one separate bundle. Um, and source maps, like literally dev tool source map. You have source maps out of the box just like that. <clears throat> And so Webpack 2 is around the corner. Um, we're very close. But something you should know, uh, so here are going to be the benefits that are coming. So ES 2015 module support. So you don't need to have Babel to use import and export, which is awesome. And Webpack is going to leverage those things to help perform stronger tree shaking and optimizing. Um, so we have some more uh, like faster compilations, um, more things built into you know, like tree shaking, um, as well as a more consistent loader syntax. You may saw there, there, there are literally two different ways to define something, and that's just because I showed you two. There's maybe four, and so, like, at first we believed that this was awesome, but I think we can justify that we would rather do a breaking change and have a consistent way of doing something. Um, <clears throat> and then my favorite, which is configuration validation. I mean, you saw that first slide with the config. Um, I mean, if you just jump into a project, how, like, how daunting does that look to you? Uh, and so we want to be able to make sure that, let's say if you want to make a change and you're comfortable, even if you're not, that we can help guide you along the way and say, uh, that property, you know, that doesn't exist anymore, or we've deprecated, or hey, you should try something else. And we'll let you know if you try to use, you know, like a wrong validation or something like that to save you the trouble of debugging for, you know, a thousand hours. Um, but there's one thing that's really important to me, and that's uh, we will keep Webpack in beta until we finish our milestone for our new documentation. So there are two things that people complained about the most, and um, one was that our documentation was terrible for first-time users. 
if you have used it before, like, and I agree, it, it is. Um, but if you use Webpack and you get it, you like it because it's kind of like a, oh, I just need to see the API guide and see everything that's possible and what properties I should be using. But it's a horrible first time user story. And that, you know, we took that to heart. And so, um, you know, we're not going to release it until our first time user experience is finished. Um, and then we will release Webpack 2 out of beta. So you can take that as, you can use it now. Um, <clears throat> or uh, that, you know, we really, like, we care about wanting to make this easy for you guys. And it's important. So looking into the future, um, we have some things that we're going to add. So like H for HTTP2 or H2, uh, Webpack's aggressive splitting plugin. So like I said, you want to have small bundles um, and you want to be able to create a bunch. So uh, we're going to have a plugin that lets you, you know, let's say create 50 of those bundles at a certain size. And so that's really powerful for performance. Um, for another H2 feature you may see is like a dependency tree driven manifest. Uh, we want to do that. What better tool than the one that creates your dependency graph to tell the server what are the most important modules in your code? Um, usability. Uh, like I said, the configuration is also a pain in the butt. And then optimizations. Uh, so we want to be able to do roll-up, which is a, I guess, probably the closest, not competitor, but inspiration to us, um, is they create really small bundles because they can inline modules together into one. And so we want to bring this feature, but we're, we're not going to deliver this in Webpack 2 uh, you know, from beta because we want it to be stable for you guys. So this requires core changes. <clears throat> But it's the first thing we're working on once we release it. And then DevTools. So uh, I've been working with a bunch of DevTool teams, uh, Edge and Chrome. Um, try and find ways to create like super awesome instrumentation. Like if you love Chrome, you should have an augmented experience if you use Webpack. Um, we have, there's so many possibilities that are possible, uh, uh, like performance marking and uh, you know more analysis, more in-depth source mapping. And then like obnoxious ideas that you know come out in my head like, hey, what if we use headless Chrome and timeline stats and machine learning? Could you automatically tweak your Webpack configuration to be super performant? I don't know, you could, maybe. I don't know like machine learning and I barely can build headless Chrome on my computer, so. Uh, and then, you know, what if we had a spec that defined modules with bundlers in mind? I mean, that's kind of where we're going now and let's, I mean, the challenges that we have gone through are literally like the manifestos that people are publishing from PC39 on how they're trying to accomplish supporting CommonJS, AMD, uh, you know, legacy modules for, you know, the browser and do ES6. Well, guess what? We do this and we make it possible. So, I mean, we want to help influence and, and aid in that process because everybody deserves a badass experience. And accessibility. So who here like has to care about accessibility? Like I work for an insurance company, we get the crap suit out of us if we don't. Um, so <laughs> we're working with Marcy Sutton um, to, to try and find unique and creative ways that we can integrate this into our testing systems. Uh, you know, like we know about all your codes, so can we see if it's accessible? Can we mount the DOM and you know behind the scenes? And yeah, there's more. So Part of this is we're going to rebrand, and so like this is us. This is our new logo, and um, we want everything to be kind of a fresh, new perspective for anybody coming back to Webpack or who is frustrated or, or whatever. Um, and so, like really quick, state of the art: who is using Webpack now? So you got that, and then here's the things that you may not know. Uh, so the Angular CLI now has Webpack. Um, that was one of my responsibilities on the CLI team. You can just npm install g angular cli. Uh, create, or who uses create react app or has tried it? You got that eject button, so don't worry, you can still configure your config. Uh, and then Laravel PHP users, like we're a Laravel shop, but this is cool, Laravel 5.3 uses Webpack out of the box by default. Um, Grails, Ruby on Rails users, maybe, cool. So there are drop-in replacements to the asset pipelines which are not that performant and uh, have Webpack replacements that are well supported. Um, as well as like ASP.NET people. I know we're in San Francisco, but it's not that old school. Oh well. 
Well, so JavaScript services is uh, built with Webpack by default. And so that's awesome. And then jhipster Java, maybe? Well, jhipster is like a scaffolding service like Rails. Um, and so it should be able to bring even Java developers the awesome experience for like Angular and Webpack or, or whatever they want. So we've grown, uh, you know, back when I first wrote these slides, it was 400%. And that was four months ago. Now we're at 800. We have 3 million downloads a year. Um, and so like, why are you telling me all this, Sean? Why does it matter? This is the one that kind of like, it gives me chills sometimes because it's so impactful. For every 100 millisecond decrease in your homepage, People saw 1.1% lift in conversion. For some companies, that's like $2 million by just using something that actually makes your code more efficient. So, I mean, if you have to try and justify this to your tech lead or whatever, show them the stats. Or here's some better ones. 53% of people abandon mobile sites that take longer than three seconds. I'm not going to go here and you know, proclaim that Webpack just by using it will solve this. You have to understand the concepts and what tools are possible. So deliver small bundle sizes, code split, asynchronously load your code. Um, but this is possible and no other tool makes this possible, trivial, um, or able to work in any stack. 77% of sites right now take longer than 10 seconds on 3G. And 19 seconds is the average load time. So myself, I have work to do. Everybody has work to do in the web performance realm. Um, to just explain why these things are so important. So housing.com, do you know Sam Saccone at uh, Google? Yes. Um, they Housing.com just released, you can go to their website on mobile. They just released a new experience and have kind of set the bar for canonical, or canonical uh, progressive web app. And it's powered by Webpack. So it is possible and it's doable. And so like the whole thing is that our core values are we want to be able to, one, every single person matters and we want to make it agnostic to your framework, uh, tools, stack, et cetera. So it's built by you. And we want to make great documentation because we give a shit. So if you want to get involved or you just want to learn and this wasn't good enough, you know, if it wasn't, just let me know because I want to tweak it to make it awesome. But this is the best video that I've ever seen uh, explain it. So frontend.center, take a look at it. Glenn Mattern, author of CSS modules. Uh, awesome Webpack. I guess there's like this awesome thing where you get a collection of all repos and so here's ours. And then uh, our new doc site. Take a look at our 85% progress uh, for our user story. Webpack.js.org slash concepts. Um, this one, I really, uh, I did the concept section and kind of focused on a lot of the things uh, that you see in these slides. If you want to help, help us triage GitHub issues. Um, if you want to help, like, maintain some of our loaders or plugins, all I ask is that you give a shit and you want to help and put in effort. I don't care if you have one commit or 10,000. It doesn't matter. We will find a place for you to help. Um, you can, if you are... Uh, more brave and you want to work in webpack slash webpack source, um, we have a huge board of things uh, specified from easy to difficult. And then you can also help on our documentation. So use webpack too. Um, people like <coughs> Netlify, uh, if you want to help build your brand for a tool that gets downloaded three million times a month, uh, come check out our open collective and um, you know talk to your managers and help us help support our open collective because uh, regardless of this or not, we still do this on our free time, um, you know, for only a couple hours a week or, or, or et cetera, when we can. And so, like, in a perfect world, I'd love to work on it full time, um, but I can't. And so we use Open Collective uh, to be able to have a transparent way for donations and sponsorships and backers. And so individual people can back or organizations can as well. Um, but it's also like a bounty source. So if you see something that you think you can contribute, and bring value and is part of our initiative, then do it and help you know cash out of our open source or our open collective. You are a part of the collective. And so uh, there's the link for it. <clears throat> you can click on the become a sponsor backer button. And then you know tweet at me, please. Um, I spend three or four hours a day on Twitter literally searching Webpack. I mean, it's true. Uh, most times, you know, if you're just trying to vent, I get it. I, I probably won't respond. Um, and I'm not a sea lion. All I want to do is 
if you're frustrated, then it's valid because we want to be able to work with anything. And if you are frustrated, then it's, we're not accomplishing our goals. So please tweet me, um, DM me. I can't promise you I'll respond immediately, but I will respond. So, um, and then also just hashtag Webpack. Like I said, I read every single tweet that says Webpack. So if you want to avoid me intervening, um, be like that secret new awesome module bundler. And I probably won't see it, but like, I want your questions, concerns, gripes, frustrations. I want it all. So. Thank you. Do you guys have any questions? I know it's kind of late, but any questions? Yes. So uh, first of all, I want to say that uh, like I'm not actually a fan of different tools, but uh, the solid and all this and comparing system JS to Webpack or like saying that HTTP two everything is like really like yes. But the question is, uh, are you planning to support Babylib? Support what? It's called Babili. It's oh, Babili. Babili. Well, I, that's what I call it, but I'm from Nebraska, so <laughs> like you never know until you like meet the authors or talk to them in real life. So, uh, yeah, that's actually one of the other things I wish I had on these slides is that we, as a community in JavaScript, lack a general purpose optimizer. So, like one of the struggles right now that we're having with Uglified JS is that transpiled ES6 classes that have properties cannot actually be tree shaken because of side effects from Uglify. All Webpack does is mark dead modules or empty modules. And then Uglify is actually responsible for eliminating that code from your bundles. And so um, Uglify has not been very helpful with us and says it's not really their problem. So uh, we still need to do something about it. And so um, I'm gonna be working with Henry Zhu, I think, Zhu. Uh, and who's one of the maintainers of Babel, and then a few other people, and we're gonna come together and have a general purpose optimizer. Um, I think that in combination with Rollup are really gonna solve a lot of the true compression problems, if that answers your question, partially. Yes. Uh, one more question right now. Yeah, so now I've the one that I've always been telling people, and it could be uh, incorrect. So there is a tool, I guess, like a static site generator for Rails called Middleman, maybe? I could be wrong, but there's also a Middleman webpack. Um, I don't know if it's a Ruby module or a runtime or whatever. That's like the best place to start. Most of the time, if I tell people, look at Middleman webpack, they instantly are like, yep, it's good for me. So that's the first place. I've had the best success with that. And they, he just wanted to know if there was a Rails replacement. Um, other questions I saw, maybe, kind of, sort of? Yes. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so one of the features I didn't mention in there is that you can, uh, for Webpack 2, and you can try it now, um, is that Webpack's config file can actually be an exported function. Or so it can be a function that returns a config object and Webpack will pass the dash dash env flag from the command line into that function. And so if you wanted to have like, I know some, I like to have composable different pieces because I'll do more than just targetable builds. And so like I may have like four or five different small partials of configs that I merge together. Um, <clears throat> but some people really like to have everything in one page. And so I think that is really helpful. Um, and I know Kent C. Dodds has a really nice kind of like boilerplate remover for environment conditional logic that does like if prod and you can pass in some sort of config option in line with where the value should be. And so like, uh, I can't remember what the, uh, where is it? Do you know what the name of that is that Kent wrote that does like, you know what I'm talking about though. It's like if prod. Okay. Um, but, it, I will, if you follow me on Twitter and spam me about it, or just send me a DM or whatever, I will, I'll find out for you. Um, but that, those are two of the big things that are important to us. And I think once we drop Webpack 2 and we finish roll-up optimizations, we have this huge discussion thread on our GitHub. And you can find it just by searching usability. But we want your input on this kind of stuff because maybe it could be more structured. Or maybe you can just define a set, like a YAML file for your environment and all the variables that are valid.
and we just kind of incorporate it. But, you know, like I don't represent everybody here. And so like, I don't know what your guys' concerns and needs are. And so we need to still make it flexible. And uh, so yeah, we value input. So please uh, comment on the discussion thread because it'll probably have some value that we want to take into consideration. Anybody else? Thank you. So first, uh, thank you for having me here today. It's just an honor to be able to speak to people and explain what Webpack is. I think it's kind of one of those passions of mine. And so I really appreciate you guys for having me. And uh, yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. And thank you.